Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Halal Gap. I'm your host, Sophia Alani, and today we are bringing you a very special episode, the panel discussion from our second annual opening credits event, which happened on October 13th, 2023, here in Edmonton. For the second year in a row, the Moskers Film Festival was kicked off with opening credits, an event where 300 Muslim creatives and representatives from organizations that seek to platform them came together. Opening credits would not have been possible without the support of our partners at InSpirit Foundation and Warner Brothers Discovery Access. With that, let's get into the discussion. Take it away, Sikandar. So last year was the first year we did opening credits, and it was intended, as I, as I said, the, the kind of the quick tagline is, is uh, create, connect, collaborate. And we had a conversation, a really, really amazing conversation. Many of our panelists are, are here tonight uh, from last year's conversation around the importance of nuanced representation of Muslims in, in mainstream arts and media. And that's a conversation that we continue to have, we will continue to have, we, we have been having for the last several decades. Um, but our hope today, rather than you know, re-having that same conversation, is to build on it. For the many, many, many artists in this room, our hope is that you can take today as an opportunity to get some tangible guidance on what does a next step look like, right? I think collectively, after we had that conversation, surprise, surprise, the answer was yes, we do need more representation in, uh, in mainstream media. And now the question is how, right? And so our, the, the panel that we've assembled for you guys today we are very confident uh, we'll be able to give you guys much of that tangible next step. Um, and so, without further delay, I would like to invite our panelists. First and foremost, um, she is a community activist and programmer who works at the intersections between community engagement, film programming, and creating access for diverse communities. As a senior coordinator of community impact at the Toronto International Film Festival, she oversees a portfolio of 50 community partners and access programs year round. And for the past decade, has worked in numerous roles as a programmer and producer. Joining us from Toronto, please welcome Huda Ali. Thank you. All right. He is an award-winning writer, director, and editor whose short films have been screened and swept the awards at festivals around the world, including right here at the Moscars six years ago. Um, where he, actually, I think he had to check an extra suitcase because he had that many new awards that he had to take home with him. Um, as an editor, he's worked with a number of major studios, including Netflix and Disney, and he recently completed his first feature film, Mustache, which premiered in competition at South by Southwest, where it won the Audience Award. We are incredibly excited to have that film screened for you guys on Sunday. Please RSVP if you have not already done so. Um, joining us from LA, Please welcome our good friend, Imran J. Khan. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, as manager of the Talent Fund with Telefilm Canada, she works to raise funds for filmmakers with diverse backgrounds through Telefilm's Talent to Watch program. Before starting with Telefilm in 2021, she spent the past 20 years in arts leadership roles with organizations such as the Banff Centre for Arts and Creativity, the Vancouver 2010 Winter Games, and the Toronto International Film Festival. Joining us from Calgary, and we won't hold that against you, please welcome Kajsa Erickson. And finally, she is an Emmy winning, Emmy award winning and Academy Award shortlisted producer who works as the VP of Finance at Faye Pictures and is a consultant for the Documentary Organization of Canada. She was previously the managing director of the Racial Equity Media Collective and the acting industry programs director at Hot, Hot Dogs Canada. We are so pleased to welcome from Toronto, Lisa Valencia Svensson. Okay, so Imran, I want to I want to actually start with you. If that's okay. So you're a filmmaker who many in our audience can likely relate to, and you're certainly an inspiration to many. I think we've seen that already so far today. Um, 
Now, as I mentioned off the top, a few years ago, you were here at the Moscars with your short film, The Joan and the Kid, and uh, we're now privileged to screen your feature film. And I'm sure during that journey over the last six years, you've had a lot that you've learned both about yourself and about your craft. I'm wondering if you can hop into Gashiv's time machine and go back six years and speak to your earlier version, your slightly younger version of yourself. What advice would you give that version of Imran? I mean, what I would, I think, I think the one thing that's like, that's kind of hindered my own, um, I guess, creativity and just like ability to create things um, in the past has been really a lot of like prejudgment, prejudgment of ideas, prejudgment of myself, prejudgment of my abilities, prejudgment of like, like every, everything along the creative path is, um, is um, uncertain. And I think if you, what I would tell myself is just, is just kind of be even more comfortable with failure and be even more comfortable with maybe being wrong about stuff and just trying anyway because I think you in this in this career in this in this industry in this like in this creative path like it's it's all about learning from doing and so whatever you have to do to trick yourself to just keep doing stuff I feel like that's what you need to do because if you stop and you think oh because there's a million reasons not to do something but I think, um, but if you can, you can just try and go for it. I think, um, I think you'll be much happier with where you kind of like where your path goes than if you sit back and kind of like say no to yourself all the time. That's I think the advice I would give myself because I said no to myself a lot. Like, oh, that idea won't work. I shouldn't work on that. I shouldn't work on this. I shouldn't work on that. And I think it's just do stuff. I think that's better. Great advice. Um, Hoda. Thank you for joining us. Um, I know many in the audience, and, and myself included, were fortunate enough to, to go to TIFF this year. And I think one of the things that surprised me was how much there is outside of just the film screenings, right? Um, so for emerging filmmakers and, and, and artists in film who may not have a project that's quite ready to screen, what resources does an organization like TIFF and you know, hopefully by extension other film festivals in other regions that might be closer to some of our, our, our aspiring filmmakers, what resources do they have that they should be looking to take advantage of? Absolutely. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I think I wanted to start off really by saying that everybody knows TIFF as the festival that happens in September every single year, but it is a space that is open year-round. We do year-round programming. And the folks at Moscars who I met during the festival had the chance to sort of experience what the industry side does. So the industry has the industry conference. It's a great place to meet other filmmakers, other producers, other folks already in the industry. But that's just one aspect of it. And in terms of emerging, I guess, filmmakers and folks wanting to engage in the creative arts and not really knowing what to do next, um, engaging in the year-round programming is, I think, a really, really great start. Um, so I've been working in TIFF for the last six years. I work in the public programming side, and we do a lot of different types of programming. For example, there's the TIFF Next Wave, which is a committee of young folk who are programmers, but they also have things like open screen, where if you are a filmmaker, you can come in, screen your film, have other folks kind of give you feedback, and that's a really great opportunity to sort of get your work out there. <clears throat> in terms of like, I do community impact programming. I co-create in cinema conversations based on a theme uh, with different groups and organizations and filmmakers. That's also another opportunity. Um, and I can go on and on. There's the industry side of the programming that has um, industry talent, uh, talent development programs. But really at the core of all of it is um, attending the programming that is there once, first, I guess, knowing about the programming that is there, knowing that all of these organizations kind of have year-round programming, that's an opportunity to meet folks. And then, two, pushing yourself to go out there and kind of engage in that in that aspect. I hope I answered the question. No, it did, <laughs> okay. it did, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Kajsa, staying on the topic of emerging filmmakers, um, I, I know you do a lot of work with Telefilm's Talent to Watch program. Can you, first of all, tell us a little bit about what that is? Because I think it's not something that everybody might be familiar with, especially here in Canada. And I'll also give you that impossible task of 
sharing if there's any common ingredient that you feel separates those that qualify from being a part of the program that those that from those that don't absolutely thank you um, so talent to watch is a program within telefilm where first-time emerging filmmakers can apply so we, the program is about 10 years old, and in the past 10 years, we have funded about 180 um, emerging artists with, sorry, about 400 emerging artists with about 180 projects. Um, what's, we take applications once a year in the spring, so uh, if anybody's interested, we can chat more about that later. But um, we, we work with writer, director, producer, team. So you come in as a team of two or three people. And we, um, we give you up to $250,000 for your first feature film. Uh, we, it can be a documentary, it can be fiction, it just has to be feature length. And I know there's some international folks in the room, so this is for Canadians. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, yeah, so $250,000 for your first feature, and then $150,000 if you're making a documentary. Um, in terms of what, what might set your project apart, I think at the heart of it is, is kind of what you said in your opening. We look for bright storytellers. We, we love to support storytellers. I'm super fortunate in what I do. Um, so the talent fund side of Telefilm, I find private money. I work with individuals, philanthropists, family foundations, sponsors, that sort of thing. Anybody who loves film and wants to maybe invest or pay it forward to the next generation of filmmakers for the first time, and then 100% of that money goes into our Talent to Watch program. So we have... Films in English and French, yes. We also, we've, we've changed the, if you've looked at the, the Talent to Watch guidelines, you know, maybe four years ago and thought maybe it's not for me, I'd consider you to have a look again because we've, we've changed a lot of the guidelines. We have, we have films in the Arabic language and the, it's, it's really a broad scope now. We want to hear diverse stories. We want to hear fabulous stories from all across the country and folks that we might not have had the chance to hear from before. Awesome, sounds good. And finally, Lisa. Um, now I know as such a, an, an accomplished producer, much of your work has been in helping make projects become reality. And I know you've also been very generous with your time when it comes to providing mentorship to those that are maybe a little earlier in their career. Um, what's the biggest misconception that you hear from artists when they come to you seeking advice and, and what do you tell them in response? Um, is it okay if I do my slight diversion? Sure, you can okay. do a bit of a detour. So, um, Sikander gave me that question a couple of days ago and I've been thinking about it and I have my answer. I also have been spending the day uh, hanging out with a few of you and being a person looking at the news. And uh, I, you know, I think really when it comes to mentorship, uh, what I always think of or what I encourage people to think about is, what are you truly trying to achieve? Why are you doing this? And arguably in this room, maybe not everyone has to be doing this, but I think a lot of you, my sense, certainly based on what the topic was last year of this conversation, is that you're trying to shift perceptions of Muslims, perhaps of people in the Arab world, perhaps of people in the Middle East, etc. And we all know what's been going on for the past week. Um, and I, I found myself scrolling through Twitter. I really, like X, I can't. Anyway, um, and, and I wanted, it's, it's tough. Trust me, I, uh, I get it. Um, or maybe I don't, but I get that it's tough. Um, and I think when I'm mentoring people, really, and I was sharing this with Sikander earlier, or someone earlier, Really, it's like, yeah, I might have all this fancy stuff to my name. I, and many of us already in here, we need all of you to come in here, into this sector, into storytelling, and join us. Because the more of us that are in here, the more the top decision makers aren't saying things to people like me 10 years ago, I wasn't hearing no inside, I was hearing no outside. Oh, your stories are too niche from mainstream Canadian funders and agencies. Uh, that's shifting, which is good. We need as many of you as possible to come in. And what is it that you can contribute? So, so many things. I wanted to read three 
quick tweets from people who are, they're high level journalists and storytellers, and so they have a platform now, uh, certainly on X, probably elsewhere, other social media platforms, and they're tweeting about what's going on in Israel and Palestine. And I realize that what they're saying are some of the key things that as storytellers, we can also constantly be striving to go get at and get to in our storytelling, in the storytelling we work to put out. One of them is Leila Maghribi. She's a journalist. She's the host of the Third Culture Therapy podcast. She's a writer of a book on Arab displacement and UK's, the UK's politically active diaspora. And you know, she was pointing out something, and it's like, I think what she's pointing out is something we're trying to all point out in various ways in our storytelling. So. And this is a, you know, it's a raw tweet. We're all losing it, internally combusting from this barbarism. My Israeli friend whose PTSD has been triggered and is spiraling. My Palestinian friend whose terror for his family is par paralyzing. Me and all Arabs, our generational trauma is reactivated and burning. So she had a whole Twitter thread about this and there was a lot of conversation. But it made me realize that often when there are these incredibly overwhelming situations, all of this stuff going on inside for each one of us, which is what storytelling really gets at. What is the core human experience is so crucial when, when we are doing storytelling. It can, it can really enhance and bring to the forefront really the human story of it all, both in the immediate and in the long term. And I think that if if in your own way, you, it can be done through comedy, it can be done through drama, it can be done through, it can be done in all different genres and forms. This is our role, or it can be our role as storytellers to try to do this. Another one was Franklin Leonard, he's the Blacklist founder. Um, they're a script, they give, um, they're, he's based in LA and they give script feedback. Um, film and TV producer, Vanity Fair contributing editor, uh, Cinema Tech and the Gotham board member. So these are like, get in the sector and get up there and join the boards and found things and write for places and become, become names because then you two can be speaking out like this and just pushing it all forward. He wrote, it just occurred to me that all, almost everyone under 30 years has no direct memory of the anti-Muslim sentiment that ruled this country, he's American, after 9-11. And I was like, oh my God, it's so true. I'm 54, I remember that. Um, and this is another thing, our storytelling can really help to fill in the blanks. Maybe already the story from only 20, 22 years ago is already starting to be forgotten, erased, under, you know, just sort of slipped to the side. And so with our stories, um, we can be aiming to keep filling in the gaps and keeping the historical record accurate and full and robust. Um, the last one was, um, Daniel Abramson, he does investigative docs for BBC, co-founding executive producer for BBC Africa I, um, and he wrote, some of the most measured voices I'm hearing on here, the ones who seem most serious about any of the agony seem to come from Israelis whose loved ones have just been murdered or abducted by Hamas. So he was like finding the humanity, finding it's like, okay, we're not going to go down the rabbit hole. Let us, let us prioritize and bring up the people who are talking about how do we move forward in positive ways. And I think it's, it's in our minds all the time in ver to varying degrees. We can really, in our storytelling, be some of the people helping to shape and shift and lead the conversation forward at all times. And often the stories that we're putting out, they're not in, at times like this past week, at, at crucial crisis times. All, the, all of what gets talked about in the mainstream media at these times and in alternate media, on social media, everywhere, has been framed by years and years and years of storytelling and, and, and news making. And you know that inherently because of who you are um, and how you've had to grow up and see yourself represented. And I think we, if we're joining storytelling in one way or another, story creators, uh, this is part of what we're contributing to. We are contributing to the dialogue. And, and you might feel very emerging and um, you have a tremendous amount to offer. If I can really quickly say, Sikander, my sort of more generic answer to that, because I think it all ties, if that's okay, it's quick. Um, what I find when I mentor, it's mostly documentary filmmakers, but I find that people are often underselling what they bring. And so often what I do with people is I work with them to say, pitch yourself to me in 30 seconds and let's make sure you're putting your most important accomplishment, your like first, right? So you heard my bio, all fancy, Emmy awarding, uh, blah, 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 blah. I know that has to go first. And it's not just 
it, it's because I too have to keep impressing the decision makers, right? So if, if each one of you figure out what is that thing, I bring way more than I think I do, and I will work with each person to figure out what is it in what you've already achieved and accomplished, what you've experienced, what you've done, what your films have done, what your storytelling has done, what award you've won, what you've contributed to, that you're gonna, we're gonna highlight in the first 10, 15 seconds that someone meets you, because usually I find people have way more to contribute than they themselves are telling me when, when I'm meeting them in mentorship. So I really want to encourage you to think about, to, to think of yourselves, it doesn't matter how emerging, you have probably a whole wealth of things to bring, and it's about making sure that you're highlighting it and making it shine and feeling it inside, because let me tell you something, this world needs you and your stories. Thank you, thank you for that. You know, I think when, when we talk about so much of what has been already mentioned, but when, when we talk about success or, or, or being able to enter into rooms that can at least pave the path towards success, so much of it is about your network, right? And so much of it is about how do you, how do you even get into that room? How do you develop that network? And as we know, in, in, in so many industries, and this is no exception, it's more about who you know than, than, than what you know. And when we're dealing with these, this existing underrepresented community, there's that additional barrier that exists when you don't have someone necessarily that you can reach up to and say, hey, you've gone through a similar experience as I have. Uh, you know, can you be that mentor for me? So I, 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 wanna, I wanna ask, Imran, I'll go back to you first. You know, especially as someone who has navigated building, you know, professional relationships in spaces where you might be the only, the only Muslim in the room, how, how has that journey been for you in terms of just the networking aspect and being able to develop a peer group within the film uh, industry? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, there's two aspects of it, the, or the way I see it, there's two aspects. There's one, it's like, it's like this, like, the, like your, your peer group um, that you meet when you're starting out, um, that could be uh, you know, other people who are from a similar background to you or not, but, but those like initial bonds of, oh, we're all starting out and trying to figure it out, figure out how to, you know, be filmmakers together or writers or whatever it is. Um, that, that is a very um, important, those are important bonds because those are the bonds that like kind of last through your whole career. Um, I made some of those bonds in film school. I made some of those bonds um, pre before going to film school with just friends making YouTube videos and like that those things carry through um, and um, and I think that's really important and then the other part of it is like working in industry and developing like professional relationships with um, people and just doing a good job I think it's like it's like it's like you could be I guess I uh, give an example like you if you let's say you've written a really great script and you're working in um, some sort of professional capacity at like a, a, a t for like a TV show or a studio or some some kind of like um, something in entertainment, but like you don't like you have this great script and you know like you could show it to people who you work with. But I think like um, the part of it that's important is like you have to be doing a really good job at the thing you're doing at that place. So it's like if you're just getting coffee for people and you're like an assistant or you're like whatever, you have to like you have to do a really good job. People have to like you. <laughs> like they have to like you for like what you're providing for that organization. And and like you're you know, and that then, you know, you develop relationships and then at some point you when you feel like it's a good time, you can make that ask. You can say, Hey, would you would you be willing to read something that I wrote? Um, you know, and, 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 then, and then you can do that. But I think if you kind of put the cart before the horse and you like only focus on networking and you're not like kind of like doing, like, like actually just doing work that's, that um, people f are finding value in, like in your kind of professional life, then I think it's harder to make those leaps. Um, that's what I've seen, at least in my, in my experience as somebody who worked in editorial um, and, and was able to make that leap to directing, like, or is it's sort of in, still in, in process of making that leap, but, but, but somewhere along that way. Um, I, can, I feel that like the key of it is always like, are you, do, you know, doing, a, the priority is like doing a really good job at the job that you're 
you're um, being hired to do, and then and then when those opportunities arise, like making use of those opportunities, and I think that is how I kind of navigate that part, or I have, and it's been, um, yeah, like I mean, yeah, you you can't you can't be too forward thinking, I guess, in in that like if people get a sense of that you're just trying to use this like like that you're not focused on your job and you're really focused on something else, like they get a sense of that, and then like it can it can be not good professionally. So I think you've got to really, like, you know, get the... What, people have said this before, like, oh, you have to get, like, if you want to, you know, move ahead in, in, in Hollywood or in entertainment, it's like you got to... If, and if you're starting from the, like, assistant level, it's like you got to get the coffee orders right and all that. Like, you have... Like, whatever your job is, you have to do a good job. Like, yeah. Um, by the way, f anybody feel free to jump in at this point. We're, we're, I'm not a big fan of... Free and open? One, two, yeah. three, four. Like, this is meant to be a conversation, so please, please do feel free to jump in at any time if there's anything that uh, anyone says that you guys would like to build off of. Um, but but on, on the same topic of creating networks and communities for underrepresented communities, um, Hoda, I know so much of what you do is exactly in that, in that field. So can you talk to us a little bit about some strategies that you've seen that have worked well with underrepresented communities? I mean, not just underrepresented communities, but I think all communities. Um, and I'm going to jump off a little bit of what you were saying in terms of um, it's really about building that relationship. A lot of it is about, one, having the conversation, meeting the people, but not immediately jumping into this is what I need from you. A lot of it is is how do you authentically build a relationship? And I think that's at the core of, of networking. But in terms of authentic, um, building in community, but I think the points that I wanted to talk about and what I genuinely was thinking about and the types of workshops that I do in terms of for community are really talking about when networking, like what is your goal? Do you, do you walk in and kind of already have like a pre-established goal in your head? Do you want to meet a person who's an editor? Do you want to meet a person who's this, who's that? And kind of um, have an idea of what you want to say to them. So the second part of that is what are you sharing? What's your pitch? What's your, what's your idea that you're trying to share? And I wanted to share, an, uh, I guess, a story about the time I like put myself out there. <clears throat> and before I got my job here, I was doing, uh, I did documentary research for, for a documentary, but I was at a conference like this, and there were two panelists on stage. They're very well established in the industry. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm interested in this, and I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna walk up to them. I said what I had to. I was like, hi, my name's Halda. I'm a grad student. I'm not quite working in the industry, but this is what I have to offer. Hi. <laughs> so from there, it kind of went into, nothing really happened for six, I think eight months later. Um, the director messaged me on, on Facebook and was like, hey, I remember you, we had this conversation, can you send over your CV? And from there, that, that relationship started and I worked with them for a year. So a lot of it is about, one, taking the time to actually meet folks out there, sharing what you actually do and getting the word out there, and, um, and doing the work, like you said. And then the second part of it that you said, and I wanted to jump off was, don't forget about your peers. A lot of the folks that I worked with 10 years ago are now in established mm. spaces, and you're now like, hey, yeah. you can build with those folks. And, and those two key things kind of took me to places, and, and yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. like the people, I've seen that happen so many times where like the people you knew way back 10 years ago, whatever, like they're in some new thing they're doing and then they call you up and say, hey, are you available to do blah, 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 like and you get a job out of it or an opportunity out of it that happens a lot and it's just those, they just, I think there's something very special about like when nobody was anything and when the people you knew when nobody was doing anything, those people kind of, there's a bond there. And okay. it may not make sense, and it may not like there. It, it, there may not be logic to it, but it's just like okay, I know you as a person, and like I can trust you. And yeah. I, sometimes that's all that matters, you know. Yeah, I was gonna say also, burn bridges very carefully because they will never go away. <laughs> uh, in this industry, it's quite small. So those same people, if you burnt a bridge with them when they weren't a very 
in a very important position. Mm. They will remember that when they are in a very important yeah. position. So don't do it, actually. Um, the other thing I was going to say is certainly every time I've ever been to any event in our sector ever, I've had a very specific goal in my head. It doesn't mean that I'm wandering around just like being so rude and obnoxious and everything, I just want this, whatever. No, I'm, I'm genuinely wanting to interact with people, but I did, there was a, the International Documentary Association based in LA has a big documentary conference every two years. They had one in 2016 and I was determined, first I, my, so I started at Hot Docs, my pitch to be invited to be on a panel so that I could save the cost, some cost, and that worked. So my planning to get to the conference started in April in Toronto. Um, and then once I got there, I knew my goal at that point is I wanted to, um, I had done one documentary in the, mostly in the US space. I've always lived in Toronto, but I was, I'm a dual citizen of the US, Canada. And um, so I had made one film which was on PBS and it was like the big film. And then the next one was in Canada. And then I was like, I can't stand Canada anymore because I'm queer, a person of color, whatever. And it's like the early 2010s. It was terrible. Um, there was truly no support. And, uh, and so I want to go back into the US where I feel like there's a little bit of support as a BIPOC person. Um, and so I wandered around that conference for three days very happily saying, I'm the producer of Herman's House. Do you, oh, you remember me? Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for another US project to get involved in. What are you working on? I'm a US and Canadian citizen, so right in the way, right, right away people know they don't have to worry about, oh, but aren't you from Canada? Don't we have to worry about something there? Whatever it is. And I, I, I wandered around and I found my next project and it was a US project and it was on PBS again two years later. And um, so I think there is no harm. It's fundamentally a competitive industry and fundamentally um, a hard, hard market industry. And I think you want to remain genuine because people will pick up on fake energy right away. Um, but you also want to be very clear and, and certain of, and you want to be able to express it to people with certainty. This is what I'm looking for today. It could be, oh, I'm just here to hang out and see what people are talking about. Perfect. Because everyone is doing a couple things at any one of these events. They're casually interacting and they're also very we're all sussing each other out. We, you may or may not realize you are all, we're, and it's fine, it's, it's appropriate. We're all sussing out who would we like to work with. I swear to God, this is happening endlessly at these events. So know it and present. Present what you'd like people to know about you because you know that that's happening nonstop, whether people are conscious of it or not. Oh, oh, I was just going to add on to that in terms of when you're, you know, for us at, at Telefilm, if you're coming to us um, as a writer, director, producer team, some people wonder, well, how do I find my producer, writer, director? And, and it's coming to, you know, we're, we're all gathered here today and hopefully you're, you're meeting and chatting each other with each other, but keep watching for other events, you know, whether it's um, local guilds or unions or groups or other festivals or different professional organizations like Ampia or the Directors Guild um, and other events like the, the Banff World Media Festival that happens in the summer. And, and you think, well, how can I go to that? Because those are for established folks. Lots of these, these places have opportunities for emerging storytellers and creators. So look into those. You might have to sign up for a bunch of email lists <laughs> to find out uh, where those opportunities are. But when you meet people, Maybe even here you're meeting somebody, you're like, oh, maybe this person could be my next producer. Um, you know, pick your folks carefully because when you, you come and work, come and do a project, you're going to be working together from, you know, early development to creation and production and post and festival and you'll be together for several <laughs> years. So choose your, choose your close folks carefully. But yeah, be curious and be an enthusiast. I, I, I want to just in, in the interest of time, and of course we'll circle back to whatever uh, still has burning questions at the end, but um, I wanted to build off something actually that Hoda was talking about earlier, which is around pitching, right? And, and pitching yourself, pitching a project. Um, it's an aspect that I think many creatives, um, you know, it, it, it's something that you might not immediately think about when it comes to doing a creative project, right? Is it that ability to actually sell, whether it's selling, you know, your talents or selling the benefits of a, of, a, of a certain project. And gosh, that, just to kind of go back to you for a second, because I know you're in a, a very unique position in that you both do a lot of pitching for Telefilm, and then you also are part of a program that many 
artists pitch to be a part of. And so I'm wondering if you've seen in any capacity, how does the pitch change based on who the audience is? Oh, great question. Um, I, I think it, there's an important element to that in terms of um, sometimes literally reading the room. I mean, as Hoda was saying earlier, you know, it's not at, at, you're not at a cocktail reception meeting somebody saying, okay, I want to give you my 30 second pitch right now. A lot of these, those kinds of relationships maybe can take a year and a half or, or they t can take time to, to build and um, you've got to get to know somebody often before you can pitch. Um, other cases, it's, it's different. So um, I write a lot of grant applications. Maybe some of you do too. Um, sometimes you're just, you're, you're writing up that application or you're, you're making your, your pitch video for telefilm. Um, again, I, I think it's so much about enthusiasm, authenticity, um, letting your fabulous story shine through. Um, and, you know, and, and also the details of reading those guidelines. I know the guidelines are a pain sometimes, but if it says, you know, to put in a five minute video, don't give us the 30 minute cut. Or, <laughs> you know, if you're doing an online application and, you know, they're respectfully asking for a one pager, okay, go with that. Um, I, I think the more that you, you show that you, you can do that and, uh, and follow through, uh, like you were saying too, Imram, like whatever job you're doing, whatever pitch you're doing, do it well, fit the guidelines, fit the constraints. Um, it can be frustrating, but you're, you hone your pitches well over time. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there any specific do's or don'ts that any of you guys have come across when it comes to either pitching or, or being pitched that, that stand out for you? I, I have, it's not a do or a don't, but I think um, with her, well certainly with Herman's house, I think we had 80, 80 meetings over four industry events. <laughs> so it was like, oh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And what I realized after a while, it's like, oh, they're not just gauging, yeah, we have all this great access, it's such a great story, blah, 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 blah. They're gauging the energy between, I was the producer, me and the director. Because they're trying to figure out what's the energy? Not just do we want to work with them, but they, do they actually want to work with each other? And do they have the glue that's going to bind them? Not if, but when it gets really hard and when they want to strangle each other. They were sussing out our energy. And I think realize that because if you're not in a good place with your team, trust me, the people you are pitching to, if they have any experience at all, they will pick that up in a minute or a second, maybe before you have. And they're, that's what they're gauging. They're like, do we want to give them several hundred thousand dollars? Probably not, because this is probably not going to go well. So I think it's realizing what they're evaluating as you're pitching them. They're not just evaluating the strength of the story. They're not just evaluating the strength of the access. They're very much evaluating you and whether they think you can do this in terms of product, it's product going out to market, it's being funded, there are gonna be major legal re uh, things that need to be taken care of, and they're evaluating if they think you have it to be able to make this happen, and if you have the maturity and the skill and the experience, not necessarily you've done it before, but the experience to know how to make sure you've got people on your team who will help you through the things you don't know, they're evaluating you. And um, just, just be aware of that. I know now you're gonna be even more terrified, but don't be, because um, uh, at the same time, you're gonna, re you're gonna start to remember what are all the strengths you bring, maybe not necessarily directly from working in this sector, but you have a lot of strengths that you've already developed in your life and a lot of experience. So you're gonna also, it's important to build that so that people are picking up on what's already in you. Right on. I would just add quickly too, um, for us at Telefilm, I would say it's also okay to ask questions along the way. Some people might look at you know, the website or the application, not just for Telefilm, but other programs you're applying to, and go, oh my gosh, it's a lot. I don't know if I can do that. I, that third thing they're referencing, I'm not really sure what that is. Um, reach out to us, ask questions. We would so rather you look at these things and ask us in advance, or if you're applying through one of our partners, ask them, because we would so rather have the dialogue with you in advance 
then you get to the 23rd hour, the, it's due tomorrow, and, and you're not sure. And you're like, I don't know, I kind of guessed on that part and I put it in. It, it's okay. We know this is a program for emerging filmmakers, so chat with us in advance. We're, <laughs> we're, we're more than happy to. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, in terms of pitching, I'm not necessarily the person to be pitched, but I, get, I hear pitches all the time. And I'm always like, I, I don't know if I'm the right person you should be pitching to. But um, I think for me, how do I put this? So a lot of filmmakers approach me and they're like, hey, how do I get my film into the festival? This is what, this is what my pitch is. And I'm like, I don't do festival. <laughs> I do year round. But a lot of that conversation and a lot of the great pitches that I've heard have led to me having a conversation with somebody else saying, hey, did you hear about this? So even if you're not pitching to the right person, it's, it's still going to kind of hit impact if you have a really strong pitch and you know what your log line is and you know what the story you're trying to tell is and, and that can easily be passed along. And in terms of, um, in terms of like short films, I program uh, short films for, for a tip. The ones, I think just quick tips are like, make it easy for people to have access to that information. Like a quick email that has all the information readily available make their life a little bit easier in terms of accessing that information, if that makes sense, because that is also helpful tips at the end of the day. Ask for their actual contact. Actually follow up and say, hey, this was me. You have my contact. Those are like key things that you can actually follow up immediately after meeting somebody. Um, I was going to speak from the pitching side um, that um, I'm still trying to figure out how to pitch but but i think it's like it's like a skill you have to get better and better at but i think things that have so far have kind of like been like advice people have given me that have has been helpful for me is is just really like if you can just talk about um um i mean it sounds really basic but like it's like really like like your excitement for whatever the project is um can come through in just in just like in, in the f one the format of whatever you're doing, but even when you're just talking about it, like really um, almost like I like the I like the way this is phrased. Like somebody told me this a while a, a while ago, which is like it's like pretend like it's a movie you've already seen or a thing you've already seen, and you're just telling a friend all the cool things you liked about it. And that is like a really, it kind of changes the way you think about it because then now you're just like, oh yeah, and then there's this scene where this happens and then this and then, it, and it was so amazing because, um, you know, and it's like, it just changes your energy, I think. And it also changes like what you choose to focus on. Because I think like, it's not really about plot at the pitch level. I think plot is a part of it maybe. And I think you can get bogged down in plot. I've certainly gotten bogged down in plot when I've, when I've done, and then people are like, what, what, you know, it's like, it's not, it's just kind of goes, gl people, gl their eyes glaze over and they're just like, what they want to know is what does it mean to you? And like, what's your connection to it? Like, why do you want to make it? Like, those are like emotional questions. And if you can like really infuse that with like your pitch of whatever it is, it's just like so much more compelling and interesting to hear for the listener that I, I don't know, those are things that I try to focus on. Um, again, it's like, it's a skill that they don't, you don't, you don't become a filmmaker to learn to pitch, I guess. Like you learn, you become a filmmaker to be, a storyteller, and then you and then you realize, oh, in order to do that job, I need to learn how to pitch, and then now it's like another skill you need to learn. So it's like something you can get better at. I think. Yeah, I think I think you know there seems to be a bit of a disassociation between the artistry and the business side of whether it's the entertainment industry or you know music or, or like film, music, whatever it is, right? Within the arts in general, but to your point, Imran, like financial viability is still something that has to be considered, right? Both on the personal level, everybody here has to live and, and, and eat, um, and, and also on the project level, because if, you know, at the end of the day, if it's not financially feasible, the, the funding starts to, to run out. So, there, you know, ju just kind of the last topic before we, we, we turn it over to the audience to ask some questions. I, I want to talk a little bit about this business side of the equation, right? And there, there's a, a perception or maybe maybe a misconception is a better way to put it, that minority stories don't sell well. And I want to know from you guys, how true is that? 
you know, is there anything, and I'm sure our friends at the Pillars have a lot to say about this as well. Um, uh, so, so how true is that? And then secondly, does it matter? Oh, I'm so <laughs> eager to... Served it they up for you. They often still don't sell well. And I think that's the hard reality. I'm part of a very high level uh, network of mostly women of color. It's people of color in the US documentary world. And we meet every two weeks. And we're really talking about things. And we're talking about the streamers and how they've taken over and how they've really uh, narrowed the type of storytelling that's being made and who the decision makers are and who's still getting it and how can we still convince the very white dominated industry to effing move aside already and really make room and how the George Floyd past three years have only gotten so far and now Hollywood is pulling back. Um, and I think in Canada there's a lot of lip service being paid and please, all due respect, I realize we have one of our key funders right here. Um, I know that at the highest levels in Canada there's still a lot of complete not understanding of what, not, DEI I think is a waste of time I think it has nothing to do with reality. I think we're talking about issues of oppression, marginalization, power, uh, inequality, and I think none of the people in charge of, of any of our major institutions truly understand what that is. And so I think, therefore, that stories that are really trying to talk about these issues don't truly make it that far in Canada quite yet. A, a few do. A few do because there are some people in the system. I'm making broad generalizations here, um, but I did have an uh, kind of a bird's eye view onto the upper levels of our industry for a year. Last year, um, doing the work that I was doing and I came to realize a lot of them still don't get it. Uh, but there are some and so it's like being squeezed through and maybe you make it and maybe you don't and it's still underfunded and all the rest of it. So that is why I say things like come and join the industry and push. Help in join in pushing. Some of you are going to make your way up to higher level decision making positions in five years and ten years and you're going to be part of this answer uh, and you're going to be part of why the answer is changing and some of you are going to be making your stuff and you might be in other countries as well. I know many of you already are working in other countries as well um, and pushing there and achieving. It's going to be uneven um, and I don't want to sugarcoat it. It is not easy and once you hit the upper echelons you're like oh for the love of, you know, it's like, oh my God, there's a long way to go. So we need you all to help with that. Nobody else wants to, uh, nobody else wants to touch that? Nobody, yeah. <laughs> no, everyone's quietly putting his mic down. All right, oh, fair enough. Um, no, no, to that, I'll just say, watch, watch for our job postings. <laughs> there you go. Not just us, but other organizations. We, we need more folks in this industry, changing it from within, from the inside. Um, we need our storytellers, we need f the folks behind the camera, but for those that are interested on the business side, talk to us, talk to other organizations, find your way in. There's, we want, we absolutely want that. Yeah, and, and, and I, am, I am reminded of something that was said on this panel last year by, by one of our friends, Sahar Jahani, who's an incredibly talented writer, and you know, I'm, I might butcher this quote, but she says something along the lines that there's enough stories about, you know, white men, and, uh, you know, it's time that we start promoting and seeing and, and selling stories that are of more diverse backgrounds, more diverse narratives. Um, and I know, you know, obviously, Imran, your film is a, a great representation of that. I mean, you don't win the audience award at South by Southwest by accident. So have you seen that there is a shifting momentum or is it still as much of an uphill battle as, as we might think it is? I mean, from my vantage, my vantage point, non-decision maker uh, vantage point, um, I think, uh, I think it's still tough, but I, but I do think that people, there is a genuine, um, it feels like there is a genuine, uh, not only curiosity, but, um, you know, wanting to hear different perspectives and have those perspectives represented in film. There is like, like a, a want for it. Like how real is the, is that want sometimes? Like, like do, do does it, is, sometimes I think, like I go back and forth, is it, is it more that people want to feel like they tried to find a diverse story? Like it just like to, kind of check a box that like, oh, we like considered this thing? Or is it that they really want to make them? I don't know. I, I, I think it 
maybe depends like person to person and studio to studio and, and executive to executive on that. Like how genuine is the like want to kind of like find to be more inclusive about like what, uh, who, who gets to tell their stories. But, um, but, I, but I do think there is like a genuine curiosity and a genuine um, like from audiences and from like just talking to people, uh, uh, the people of like all kinds of backgrounds who have watched my film like at, at South by Southwest and, and other festivals, like just hearing them really appreciate like just seeing something that was different and not something of their, what they would normally be exposed to. I think people do really like, there is like, like a want to understand and a want to see think uh, uh, experiences that are not their own. I certainly feel that way. Like one of one of the joys for me of like as a film, um, as just a film lover, is to see films from all over the world and like get to live in a different place for two hours and and experience life through a character for two. Hours. I think that's like such an amazing and compelling aspect of film and of cinema that um, I think we undervalue that like how powerful that is and so we don't we think maybe nobody wants to hear our stories but i think people it's like i think it's a, a very human and compelling thing if if um if you can do it and connect with people but yeah i don't know i don't know like i don't know about the like industry like willpower to like see it happen but i can just speak as like a film fan and as a filmmaker that it feels like people do want to see they want they want stories that are that are um, that challenge them and that are interesting and that are uh, putting them in shoes they wouldn't otherwise be in. Well said. I, I we are now a, gonna. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna. I realize I I'm like, am I all doom and gloom tonight? <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, but it's um, what I realize is the audience is absolutely there and has been there for a long time. The issue is the gatekeepers, not the audience. So I just wanted to, yeah. yeah. Well said, well said. We are gonna, oh but, sorry, hold oh, sorry, on. Hold last on. thing. No, no, please. But, oh. but applicants <laughs> too, applicants. Because yes, there are gatekeepers, totally, totally get that. But for Talent to Watch, we just funded, and we, we fund once a year for this program, we just funded 18 feature films. We had 126 applications from across Canada in a year. That's not a lot. We want to, it's a national program. We want to hear voices from all provinces, all territories. It's a national program. I also want to see secretly more in the West. Um, but, um, but people need to apply. And you know, we do have two Alberta projects that got funded, um, we just announced in the last few weeks. So also we need folks to apply. Gosh, so can you remind us again how much they get? Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Two hundred and fifty thousand reasons project, to apply, guys. Or a hundred and fifty thousand each project for documentaries. Right on. So right on. Help, help us, help us give the money away. Hey, there you go. Uh, hold that quickly, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience. Hold that. You had. You were. I think they touched to, on it in terms of like the audience is there. A lot of the time that I'm speaking to our community partners, they want to see the films. They want to know about them, um, and we could fill. Uh, a cinema very, very easily. I think it's about knowing about the films and I'm not on that business side, but also the advertising in Canada is a little, a lot less than the US. So a lot of the times folks don't know about the films unless they're actively searching for them. So if I were you, I'd also be looking out for films and looking out for what's coming out as well. Right on. Um, okay, so Tamina on our team has a mic that she's going to be passing. So, uh, a lady over here has had her hand up for quite some time, so we will make sure that we get to her first. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Reem. I was on MasterChef Canada. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as the first Muslim hijabi Mashallah. on the show. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so I graduated as an engineer, but after Master Chef, I, I became a chef. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. It kind of made sense, so I just shifted from there. And I'm, I, I, I've always loved art, I always loved you know, writing poetry and writing stories. So um, I tried like taking food into uh, an artistic place. Um, so what I wanted to say about like how the West, yes, they want to hear the exotic, mm. you know, stories and the unique stories and everything. But usually what I noticed is they wanted to convert. So they're really, 
interested about that hijabi who falls in love with the white guy and then she takes off her hijab <laughs> to marry him. Or that famous chef who goes on <laughs> a reality TV show but then says, okay, I'm gonna cook pork because I have to. Uh, so it's always about what you're doing to fit into the narrative of becoming more like that narrative. So yes, you're unique, we want you, but we also want you to get into our narrative. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is how as Muslim creators who does not want to convert into another narrative have our stories out there in a way that is interesting and also befits our values. Wow. Beautiful question. Right on. <laughs> that's tailor made for you, Imran. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that's like that. That might be like the the most like like that is the profound question of of this generation of artists. Um, of Muslim artists in the West is like what is our place and how do we how do we express ourselves in authentic ways that um, that don't like undermine who we are and what we're about like I think that's like that's I mean I can I I think um, the only thing I can offer that as a filmmaker I think I think um, when you Sometimes those the, the reason so, sometimes the reason that happens in a story like it becomes what kind of what you're describing is because inherently you need conflict inherently you need stakes inherently you need um, you need something happening in the story that's compelling and so a lot of times like people are um, people are giving notes in the process and they're just they're into no fault it's like people want to make something good. Like they want to make it good, and how do we make it compelling? Maybe it's what if you throw in a white boyfriend or whatever. <laughs> like I, they're just they're trying to help, you know. Like they're trying to help to make it like how do we? But 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 yeah, but so it's like they're trying to help, and they're like, oh well, what if it's this? What if it's that? And then like ultimately, that's how stories are shaped, and that's what kind of happens. And like and then you can see like okay, they're trying to increase the stake. So I think if you, I think one way to like to do your own thing that still works for you and for, for, for um, that, that feels good when like we watch the movie and we feel good about it. I think one way is to like understand where that's coming from. Like not to be like, oh, I don't, like I disagree with that and that's so bad. It's like, instead of that being like, okay, I get like, like that functionally like in like a mechanical way is serving a purpose in the story. Now, but like what's a way that I would do it if I, we, I didn't want to do it that way? but still serve that. Because you can't just void it. You can't just like not do that thing. Now you don't have a story. And now people are like, well, it's not really a story because you've ha there's no conflict here. There's no, so it's like, you need to like actually, so you have to work harder to like actually um, replace that thing that you don't like with something that still functions and is good as a story. <laughs> I mean, what, there you go. I don't know, Flip but I'm not gonna we say go. that's what, it, but I'm saying like, you have to really understand storytelling because if you understand functionally like how a script is working, then you can like actually offer a solution that is like like a win-win that like works and is like interesting and, and new and surprising but still is giving people a story. Like and I think like sometimes it's like I've seen both like where it's like like offensive and it's like okay, I guess that's what it is. And then I've seen it where it's like not offensive but it's also not a story. Yeah. And it's like, I don't think that's good either. And it's like, what's the point of that? Nobody's gonna watch that. So it's like, I think what you wanna do is like, figure out what is that, why is this note coming to me? Oh, it's because the second act just doesn't have any rising stakes or whatever. We gotta, then now you understand like from a story, you can like address it in a real way and now do something cool and interesting that like only you would come up with because you're, you have a unique per point of view and you can, so I think that's like, I think like the way to, and it's like kind of diving into craft. It's like if you can increase your like craft, then like you can actually solve those problems in an interesting way. And if you, if, if you, if you are, then, then there's like lazy answers, like lazy solutions that like nobody's really happy with. 
but right on. That's fine. awesome. I have um, a very quick addition. Okay, sure. Also, that a bunch of you have to become the decision makers who are giving the notes. Yes, yes. yes. absolutely. That's a, that's a and, and I think that's a good note for our friends at both Telefilm and TIFF to take away is that there is a vast array of different stories that we are trying to tell, and unfortunately, we're still seeing that only a specific type of story is getting made. So I think that might be a note to take home as well. Um, and, and trust that not everybody wants to change your story. There's, there's also that possibility yeah, there too. There we go. Well said. Well said. Assalamu alaikum. Um, oh this question. Sorry, can you actually introduce yourself? Oh, you yeah. do as well. That'd be great. Uh, thank my you name is for Alex Eskander uh, director, producer. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, my question is about positioning. Imran, you work mainly in the studio system, I assume. Mm -hmm. Kind of formally, formally, formally? Yeah, formally. yeah. As a, an edit, as an editor, I was I was in the studio system. Now I'm kind of independent. Yeah. Yeah. So my question really is about positioning. You know, um, some of you maybe have projects on the circuit right now, and you're working towards that first feature. Could you guys give some advice on how to position yourself, approaching that first feature, if you haven't ever done a first feature yet? Um, how to best prepare, I don't think you're ever ready, really ready to do your first feature, but how to best position yourself so that you are ready to come to town to watch or you know, pitch your project to bigger, for bigger projects and budgets and stuff like that, yeah. Well, well for us again, I, I think it, um, it comes to bring us, bring us the best story that you want to tell, that you're genuinely enthusiastic about. Um, Make sure you've gone through the guidelines, as I said, and and also like with something like if you're approaching us for talent to watch, make sure that you've got the people that you want to work with that you can spend the next three to five years with maybe. Make sure that it is, say, a film that you can make on a $250,000-ish budget. Um, not every film is, is meant for that. Um, so it's that balance of having your, your realistic view of the budget and, and maybe your first film you're not making with a cast of 500 or something like that, but you, you've got, really, it's the compelling story. I, I, I maybe, um, and then also I think, um, just to add more things, like um, having a good short is helpful uh, for me that was helpful to have like a short that like I could send to people to just for them to have confidence that I could um, manage tone manage tone manage a story just understand how to uh, tell like tell a story visually like I think people like to see confidence in that I think in general um, so I think that's like important and then um, so but aside from that yeah you're not really ever ready but um, but yeah, you have to have a script that's like that people are excited about, that people really want to support you with, um, and that's hard. That's really hard. <laughs> I oh yes, no. yeah, please okay. go ahead, Lisa. Um, also, I mean, a short or a few shorts, like even so, you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> it's like documentary narrative doesn't matter. It's like how can you possibly make a 90 minute if you've never even made 20 minutes, right? Like, yeah. Just shorts or I, I, TV, shorts. any experience uh, like that. Something, yeah, something, something. Um, and I think, um, oh gosh, I think the, what was I about to say? Um, the other thing is, it, we're back to the networking. Like how do you position yourself is also through the networking so that when you're bringing your project forward, if people already recognize your name, oh, isn't that the guy? That's what you want. That's what you want to be happening in the jury conversation. Oh, I think that that was the woman who. Oh yeah, I met her once. Oh yeah, I was really impressed by. You want that conversation among the jury members, and how do you make that? I remember when I realized that people, all the industry, were talking to each other within about me and our my director and our project within like five minutes of meeting with us. I remember being told the next day by D, a woman I'll say D, Deborah. She's like. Oh yeah, Claire really didn't like your project yesterday. <laughs> like, oh, that's what's going on. You're all talking to each other. So there's also like understanding how to work that because trust me, uh, this is another reason why you don't want to burn the bridges. People you don't realize are going to end up on the jury for telefilm deciding who's on talent to watch. It's not just yourself. You're pulling together a jury. 
And gosh, it's amazing to realize how small the world is once you realize who's on all the juries, ma making decisions about your projects. So it's sort of like constantly networking, constantly showing people what you're doing, having this short, maybe the short is doing something, getting ready with your bio. The other pitching uh, tip I was gonna give, this I do this, you guys got this. I have a bio document that has about eight different lengths of my bio from longest, medium, short, shorter, shortest, micro. And what's really interesting about that, if you write it, it forces you to think about what's the most important thing for people to know about yourself. And that even helps you as you're networking and meeting people and presenting and then building that profile and positioning yourself. So it all kind of combines. All excellent, excellent advice. Tamina, we have a question in the front. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Um, awesome. My name is Fatima, and I'm a writer and interviewer. Um, I have a question for Imran. We, from a South Asian perspective, when we grow up, we're given, I would say, almost four choices. One is doctor, lawyer, engineer, or disappointment. Um, nice. So, <laughs> so growing up, what was the pivotal point in your life where you realized that your passion, like, gravitated towards filmmaking? And what was that pivotal point where you were like, I'm going to be a filmmaker and I'm going to stand on a stage, uh -oh. give an advice to people of like, <laughs> how to navigate that profession? Um, I, I, again, it, my, my journey was super nonlinear. It wasn't like sequential. It was like kind of two steps forward, one step back. I, I was making films in um, like sketch, you know, Muslim sketch videos in college and then and then I, uh, and then I graduated at engineering. Went to um, uh, study, uh, worked in medical devices um, for a couple of years. And then during that time, I made some more films. And then I had to really choose: like, is this like a hobby? Is it something? And then at the same time, like, I mean, it's like I'm not like um, bragging about anything, but I was like a really bad engineer. So, <laughs> so it's like I I, I wasn't like. It wasn't like a. Ch it wasn't like me being brave or something. It was more like. It was more like. Well, out of the things I have available to me as a person, like what can I like apply myself toward to like try to further my to try to create a better life for myself. <laughs> and, and so um, and so film was like I combined a lot of creative things that I like really enjoyed and I thought were really interesting and challenging and so that it was like a process of elimination of like more like what could what what can't i do what what's not working for me and like what could i apply myself and do well and so film was more that for me you know that's me personally like it wasn't like some like like one day i like i saw i witnessed a hate crime in front of my house and then i was like i'm going to tell our story it wasn't i i wish i, I had that story to t to say some people do have stories like that but like some people have like a real like like a, a story to tell. Um, uh, but I, for me, I I was just like, what do I? What can I do? You know? And then like, what do I like to do? What can I do? And then I just started kind of like working towards, towards that. Um, um, but and then I, yeah, I went to film school. But thank you. Right on. Um, we're gonna go on this side because I haven't uh, haven't asked anybody from this side yet. So, uh, My name is Noal. I'm a producer, new director. Um, I think my biggest question as a producer, mostly, but also as someone who wants to create her own projects, is money. Like that is something that I have all these ideas, and it's like, but how do I get them funded? I funded my own film through crowdfunding, but I can't keep asking my aunts and uncles for more money. Like, I can't do that for the rest of my life. So, like, what would you say? I'm American. I would have loved to apply for <laughs> the program you said, but what, what are some options to get funding for shorts and features and any of our projects? Well, I know, Lisa, you've also done a lot of fundraising in the States, yeah? I think that's... Oh, it's a whole panel. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's how do you position yourself. It's, it's like entrepreneur to the max. It's connecting maybe with producers who are excited about your work. It's networking your head off. It's finding out all the sources of funding. It's attending things. It's looking at what were the funding sources of other places. It's exploring unusual sources in the US. It's like a foundation, the pound foundation upon foundation. Maybe there's a foundation interested in the 
topic or subject matter of your film, they're not necessarily a film funder, but they'll come on board. Um, yeah, it's joining organizations that support filmmakers and learning about all their training and their mentorship and their online sessions and their et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and learning and learning and, and, and getting all the networking there. It's not a simple answer. Um, and it's not quitting the day job for a while. Because <laughs> I, I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I was just going to say, like, yeah, like, I think also just having a job that, like, ideally you have a, you have a job that you're learning something about film, like, it's a job in, in entertainment so that you're learning something about film, you're getting paid, and then you can, like, use that to make some, your own personal project. I think that can be, like, a way a lot of people, that's what a lot of people do, um, and then you don't have to keep tapping out the same, like, crowdfunding, whatever you can do. And then while you're doing that, you're also building relationships that you can cash in favors for. Hey, do you, a DP who wants to just shoot something, you might find uh, an actor, you might meet an actor that just wants to be in something. You know, like through, I feel like the, through working in industry, you end up meeting people that then want to also collaborate and just do stuff. And now you can do stuff, something way better and way cheaper just because you know more people. So I think that's, I th that's like, I've seen that work for a lot of people. Yeah. And that goes back to the network effect. Yeah. And um, sometimes international co-productions too. Sometimes if there's a natural fit for a co-production, you can look to another country to help co-fund. Which Imran did for Mustache, right? Well, uh, I mean, not like, co-fund, but you, you've shot it in Toronto. Yeah, right? so it was a Canadian co-production. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Go Canada. Awesome. Well, oh, that, there's one more, there's a bunch more questions. I know we can probably go all night, but in the interest of time, we're going to, stop it there but we will obviously encourage you guys to please listen the advice was given to you guys right here come and find these guys afterwards connect with them afterwards make sure you guys pick their brains some more they're going to be around hopefully all weekend available for you guys um, but before we wrap up I just wanted to quickly thank each and every one of our panelists one more time incredible conversation thank you guys very very much We hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Halal Gap. Stay tuned for more episodes and follow our brand new Instagram page at the halal underscore gap. The Halal Gap is a Moscars production. You can find the Moscars on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok by searching Moscars Film Festival. Thank you to our producer, Asif Qureshi, and our videographer for this episode, Yusuf Iqbal. Please rate us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. On behalf of Sikandar and myself, thank you to all our listeners for joining us for another incredible season.